you could turn to Acts chapter 3. That's where we're going to be at today, the first eight verses there. Technically, um, this is not a series. Um, we're not in a series right now. This is kind of a standalone message um, to get ready for our next series. Um, because next week, don't know if you've heard about it or not, um, but it's a pretty big deal in the church world. Um, it's Easter. <laughs> I'm really excited about it. Um, this week, uh, or next week, we're having a Saturday night service for one week only. Next week only. Um, I know we've announced this and I've gotten some messages about, are you going to go back to Saturday night services? No, 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 no. I know some of you liked them. Um, it killed the staff. We didn't really, um, it, it was hard. And so um, we're, we're most likely not going back to that um, ever, uh, but I, I've learned never to say never to God because he might say yes. Um, but next week, Saturday night service is identical to the Sunday morning services, so you're not going to miss anything if you come on Saturday night. Sunday morning is not going to be any different. As a matter of fact, you might come on Saturday night, have so much fun, you want to come to one of the Sunday morning <laughs> services as well. But Saturday night, 5.30, so egg drop is at 1, 5.30 is service time, and then Sunday morning, 7.30, 9.30, and this service will start at 11.15. What time? 11.15 is this service. Um, come early and stay late. You're not going to want to miss it. We're going to have um, a ton of fun. We are doing, um, this is the set is mostly set up um, for next week. Um, we're doing a Jimmy Fallon late night type show. Um, we've got that comedian. He's going to be here. Um, we're going to have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of fun. We're going to show the gospel in a unique, crazy, um, super fun way. Um, it's not going to be ordinary church. I 100% I promise you, um, you've never been to an Easter service like we're doing next week, um, promise. So um, come, um, come early, um, anticipate like huge things happening, anticipate life change, um, be ready for all of that. It's going to be really cool. But that's next week. Today, um, I got to get through this message to kind of set up um, sort of what next week is, is going to be like. And let me, let me set it up like this. If I were to, to do a survey of this room and ask you, what's something that you really, really, really want? Like, if you could have anything in the world, what is the thing that you want most, the thing that you would love to have? Now, here's the thing about that question. Everybody in here has an answer. Everybody here has that thing or maybe those things that you would love to have. And, and I get it. I understand we're in church and it's a Sunday and there might be somebody here saying, I know, I don't need anything. I already have Jesus, and Jesus is enough for me. Jesus fulfills me. Jesus sustains me. I have Jesus, and that's good enough. Well, you're just being goofy. Like, honestly, we all want something, right? I mean, all of us want something. For, for example, how many of you would love, just right now today, would love a vacation? Just anywhere, a vacation, any, I just got back from one, man, and I want to go on like eight more. Like, just get me there. How many of you would love to be at that place? I don't even know where that place is, but it looks magical. Does it not? Marcus, does that look good? All right, cool. I know you don't like the sun, and the sun's beating down right there, but <laughs> I don't know why I just picked on him. I'm sorry. How many, how many of you would love a second home, like, a, like just another place just to go away and escape to? A, a lake house. How many of you would love to have a lake house? Like, that, that's me. Um, more specifically, I would love to have a beach house. Anyone like a beach house? Like, that's just it. And if I get one, you ain't going to see me anymore except for on screen. Like, I'm just going to be preaching from my living room in my underwear. You're just going to see from here up, but I'm live streaming from there on out. I get that. How about, how about this one? I share this one all the time so you know where I'm going with this. How about a sports car? Who's with me on a sports car? That's mine right there. That's not mine. That's that's sports car right there, um, a Hellcat, but I want a sports car. Now, let me explain something to you, because every time I use this illustration, I, I get some feedback and some pushback on this, and I want you to understand, I do not want a sports car because I'm going through a midlife crisis. It's not because I turned 50 last week. Yes, last Sunday was my birthday, my 50th birthday. That's why I was not here preaching last week, because I didn't want to see any of you on my birthday. And, um, and so, l listen, last service, before service, some, some girl in the church, I'm not going to tell you her name, but her initials are Charlie Tigas. And so if you know her, um, she came and she gave me a present. She's like, you got to read the card. I wrote the card all by myself. And I'm like, okay. And so I go read the card. This is what the card said. Pastor Ryan, wow, you're 50. You don't look a day over 64. I'm like, 
I'm going to kill that little girl. So anyway, um, I don't want it because of a midlife crisis. I probably am going through a midlife crisis. I don't even know what that is. I've probably been going through that since I'm 30. Um, but anyway, I've wanted a sports car since I saw Smokey and the Bandit in the theater. How many remember that? Now, I don't, I don't want this particular sports car because if you drive like a 1979 Trans Am, you're a redneck. Like, it just doesn't matter what area of the country you live in. I mean, but especially Iowa. You, that, it's just the way it is. But I would love a sports car. Now, years ago, I had a fake sports car. Th this was my sports car right here. Geo Metro Convertible. Thing was awesome. It wasn't. It really wasn't awesome. But I had this little device that you plugged in to the cigarette lighter, and you tune the radio to a certain station, and it would make the car on the inside of the car sound like it had a big block Chevy 350 engine in it. It was great. It would, like, rattle and stuff. When you accelerated, it would go up. And that thing had two 18-inch subs in the trunk, and so uh, it was not cool. It, was, it just wasn't. But a sports car, I need 400, 500, 800, 800 horsepower in a sports car. Anybody, like, I need to go to jail in a sports car. Right? I, I just do. And listen, I'd be like Paul. I would share the gospel in prison. I, I would. I promise. I would use church money to bond myself out. I would, I would do all those things. But I want it. All, all, of us, all of us here, if I were to go around and say, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? Like we would all have something that we would absolutely love to have. Some, we want for ourselves. And so while I was on vacation, I started thinking about that in regards to our church. And so I figured on Palm Sunday, as we prepare to celebrate the resurrection next week, I thought it would be a great day to just share with you, as a pastor, what I want for this church. And so today I have five things that I want for this church. More specifically, um, not just five things I want for the church, but five things I want for everybody in the church. Five things I want for us as a group of people and as a church. There, there are a lot more, I made a huge list, and there are more for another time, um, but these are five I narrowed down to today, and I took out a one text, um, Acts chapter three. And so we're just gonna dive in, I'm gonna start, hopefully we'll get out of here a little bit early today so you can start praying and get ready for next weekend. First thing I want for this church is no more ordinary Sundays. No more ordinary Sundays. Now, here's the reason that I say that. Um, when I was a kid, many of you, this is your story too. When I was a kid, I hated, hated, hated going to church. Now, I know every time I say that, and I've used this, I've, I've talked about this before, somebody will say, well, hate is such a strong word. I know hate is a strong word. That's why I'm choosing to use the word, because I flippin' hated it. In fact, the only reason I went to church was because I was under the threat of bodily harm. My mom told me, if you don't get out of bed, I will kill you. Anybody with me on that? Like, that's the reason you went to church? And nothing exciting ever happened at church. Nothing. Now, I know somebody's like, well, Pastor Ryan, you don't know. Behind the scenes. No, 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 I do know. I was there every Sunday. The only ex excitement we ever had was when one of the nuns got in a wreck in the parking lot. Like, that, that was it. That was the most exciting thing that ever happened. Nothing exciting ever happened in church. It was always so serious and proper and traditional. It was the exact same every week. You, you walked in, and you knew exactly what was going to happen. You knew the pattern. You, you knew everything. Every Sunday was ordinary. I don't want that here. I don't ever want us to get into th this mindset where we know exactly what's going to happen, where we know the pattern, where, where we know it's three songs, a communion, and then a message, and then a song, and, and then we go home. And, and maybe we stay in that, maybe we do that, but, but there's so much more involved in all of that. The reason I want there to be no ordinary Sundays at Central is because I think every single week we should walk in the doors and, and have an experience with the supernatural. Because when we experience, like when you and I, when we experience Jesus on a supernatural basis, you can call it a lot of things, but you can never call it ordinary. And I don't know about you, but I think at Central we're past the point of ordinary Sundays. Amen? Now, the, where I get this, again, Acts chapter 3 starts out, the very first verse says this. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. Now, normally I would read that. Um, I would skip, well, you know I wouldn't skip over that. Um, but a lot of us would skip over that. But we need to understand what's really happening here. In, in Jewish culture in that time period, 
um, a lot of the days, they had multiple prayer services throughout the day. On this particular day, there happened to be a three o'clock prayer service. There was probably one or two or three of them before that. And, and I don't know if, if John and Peter went to the first couple, but we know, according to this text, they're on the way to the three o'clock prayer service, on their way. That, that's important to know, because the reason, the reason I believe that this dramatic event this turn is going to happen in this story is because I believe that Peter and John, as they're walking to the prayer service, are walking around with a sense of expectation. See, the reason that many times that we show up to church and we feel like there's been no revelation, where we feel like, hey, God didn't speak to me, that text didn't speak to me, I didn't really like the music, I, I didn't, that song didn't do anything for me. The, the reason a lot of times that happens is because there's no expectation We don't have the expectation that God is going to move. We don't have the expectation that that God is going to change lives. We don't have the expectation that God is going to do something big and unique and awesome, immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. When there's no revelation or when there's no expectation, sometimes there's no revelation. And so let me ask you this question. What would happen if we walked in 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 those doors and when we walked in, we said, I don't know what God's going to do today, but I know God's going to do something I believe God's going to heal somebody. I believe God's going to touch somebody. I believe Jesus is going to change somebody. It might not be me. It might be the person next to me. But I know for a fact when we walk out of this place, we're not going to walk out the same way that we walked in because we have no ordinary Sundays. Every Sunday is an opportunity for us to experience the supernatural. Listen, I know we do church different. I get it. We're always going to do church different here. If if, If you don't like it, it's cool. Like, there are other churches, and and I'm 100% fine with that. I I like the way they do church. I'm not saying anything bad about the way anybody else does church. But the reason we do church the way we do church is because we want this to be a church where everyone can experience the presence of Jesus every single week. And the reason that that's so important, the reason it's important for us to have no ordinary Sundays is because when we experience the presence of Jesus, we cannot stay the same. I know I I say this all the time, and I'm going to continue to say this until the day I die. You can't meet Jesus and stay the same. You can't. It's a spiritual impossibility. You and I cannot meet the Savior of the world, the the one who, who came and died for the forgiveness of our sins, rose again from the grave. Like, we can't meet him and stay the same. In fact, there has to be a holy shift that takes place in our minds and in our hearts. Like, like seriously, I want us to have a holy shift that takes place in our hearts and in our minds. I want you, when you walk out of this place, to be able to look at the person next to you and say, holy shift, that was awesome. Holy shift, Jesus did something in me. He changed me. Shift. I said shift. Shift. I know some of you are thinking the other word. You might say the other word. That's cool. But shift it to shift, all right? L- listen. You might be here, and you might not even be a Christian, and, and maybe you've been coming for weeks, and, and maybe you have felt something inside of you, just that, that stirring, and, and you're thinking, I don't, I don't know what that is. That's Jesus. That's Jesus drawing you to the foot of the cross. That's Jesus wanting you to go from where you are to surrendering to him to allow him to take you where he wants you to be. And, and I don't know about you, but for me, this is for me. I'm telling you, this has been true since the very first time I came to this church. Every time I pull up, every time I drive into this parking lot, I'm like, God, I don't know what's going to happen today, but I know you're going to do something. And every single Sunday that we've had church, Jesus has saved somebody or Jesus has changed somebody's life. We have seen it happen week after week after week. And so I don't know about you, but the reason I love this church is because we don't do business as usual. And moving forward, (laughs) holy shift. No more ordinary Sundays. Number two, no more less than people. No more less than people. Um, Many of you know that three days a week, I go down to St. Greg's down in Baird. Um, It's a recovery center for alcohol um, and drug addiction. And I love going there. Um, It is is some of the most fulfilling um, moments of my week is going down there and and interacting with people down there. Um, I have met some super interesting people there. Um, super interesting. And I have honestly met um, some of the best people in the world. 
Um, I have built friendships. I have built friendships that are going to be lifelong friendships. People who don't necessarily come to church here, they live in other parts of the country, um, but I talk to them, they call me when they're struggling. I mean, I, I just, I, I, I'm telling you, it has, been, it has been incredible, and I love going there. The main reason I love going there is because everybody's there for the same reason. Everybody wants to get better. Nobody's in there faking it. Nobody's, nobody's in there trying to pretend that there's something they're not. They're either an alcoholic or a drug addict or a combination of the, bo- of, the, of the two, and they're there because they want to get better. And I'll talk about this later, but the reason they want to get better is, is because they're honest. Like, they're honest about what they're going through, what's going on in their life. Nobody's there to check out the scenery. It's freaking Baird, Iowa, all right? There is no scenery, all right? There, there's nothing there. But, but everybody's on the same page. And everybody understands. And I'm telling you, you've heard me say this before maybe, I've learned more about how to do church by going to a rehab center than, than I ever have working in the church because of the way people interact with each other, the way people support each other, the way people are there for each other, the way people are honest about really what's going on in their life and where they want to be. And so anyway, I say all that to say this. A while back, um, a guy stopped me in the hall, and he, he asked me, he said, hey, um, you're a pastor? Like, at a church? I'm like, yeah. And he said, do you wear a robe? I'm like, no, man. Not like a Jedi Knight or something. I don't know. Maybe wearing a robe is cool. I'm not, I'm not sure. And he said, what's a pastor doing in rehab? I said, you ever work with church people? <laughs> anyway, I told, him, I told him I wasn't there for treatment. He thought I was. Maybe I should be. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Anyway, um, we'll call him Frank. All right? Now, that's not his real name, but we're going to call him Frank. Frank was a man's man. Frank was bald-headed by choice because he shaved his head. He looked cool, man. He was a fireman. Like, that was his career. He was a fireman. And uh, he looked like a fireman. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you just see some people, like, I'm a fireman. Like, yeah, you're a fireman. Like, dude looked like he could start the fire, go and save all the people, come out, and just put the fire out all by himself. Like, you just knew he was a, he was a fireman. Well, he asked me if we, if we could talk, and um, it was after service. He, he didn't come in for the service, um, but afterwards he caught me in the hallway. As we talk, I said, I can't today, um, but I'll be back on Thursday, and I could talk to you then. Um, on Thursday, um, he caught me after service. Again, he didn't come in, um, but he said, hey, man, you got time to talk? I said, yeah, I said, some time outside I could talk. We went in this room, and uh, he said, I got a question for you. I got one question I need for you to answer. I said, all right. He said, first of all, you know I used to be a woman, right? I thought that was the funniest thing I ever heard, so I laughed out loud, and, and he didn't. <laughs> and uh, as a matter of fact, tears started welling up his eyes and streaming down his face, and I was like, oh, uh, you're serious? He's like, yeah. He said, 12, 13 years ago, I went through all the surgeries. I did the change. I did, I did everything. He said, I was a woman, and now I'm not. He said, this is my question for you. Does God still love me? Does God still love me? Because I got told by a pastor that because of what I did, because of the changes that I made to myself, that God doesn't love me anymore. And I just need to know, is that true? And I'm telling you, tears welled up in my eyes, and I said, Frank, God loves you so much, man. He loves you so much. And I just left it at that. Because see, what some people want to do is they want to say, God loves you, but, and anything that follows the but negates the fact that God loves you. No, it's just God loves you, period. God loves you. And I know there's somebody here saying, did you tell Frank that he was wrong? Well, first of all, before we get to Frank, let's talk about you. Seriously, let's have a conversation about you. See, the church has an incredibly bad habit of picking on problems and sins that we don't happen to struggle with or deal with. He asked a question. Did God love him? I answered his question. Yes. Yeah, man. God loves you. But then I realized something. In the church world, especially in the church world, there are people in the room that feel less than. And you feel less than because of what you did or because of what's been done to you. Now, there are different reasons, but we'll look at the guy in the story, because it's obvious why he felt less than. Verse 2, as they approached the temple, a man lame from birth. I, I can't imagine this, not being able to walk. 
Like this guy's lame from birth. We find out later on in Acts chapter 3 he's about 40 years old. Now, in Jewish culture 2,000 years ago, and and this is true in some sects of Judaism um, today, they believed that if you were born with a physical defect, it it was either because, letter A, you were being punished for your sin or some sin you were going to commit later on in the future, or B, you were being punished for your parents' sin. So he's born. He's born into this condition. And so when people looked at him, All they could see was a person who was less than. All they could see was a person who was broken because of the way he was born. And and listen to me, he was born sinful, right? Does anybody have anything in common with that man? Everybody's hands should be up right now. Because listen to me, contrary to popular belief, we're all born sinful. All of us are born how to sinful. We're not born and then we learn how to sin. Nobody teaches us how to sin. Case in point, anybody had to teach their kid how to bite another kid when they don't get their way, yes or no? No, the man is born lame from birth, and he's always going to be looked down upon. And and everybody could see it. Everybody could see he was broken. Everybody could see the condition that he was in. And around there, everybody thought he was sinful. It wasn't like he could come to church and just pretend, just hide his sin. Couldn't do what we do. I don't want nobody to know. Just won't tell anybody. I won't try to get better. You think he ever tried to get better? I don't know. Maybe he knew there, there couldn't be. But everybody could see what was going on in his life. Lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate. You know why he was put beside the temple gate? Because he couldn't go into the temple. He couldn't go into the temple because he had a physical defect. And if you had a physical defect in that day, it meant you had a spiritual problem. And if you had a spiritual problem, you couldn't go into the temple. And if you can't go into the temple, you can't be prayed for. You can't be forgiven. You were essentially damned to hell by religious culture. The same culture that said, hey, trust in God and you could be set free. You could be healed. Not him. Not him. He wasn't good enough. He was less than everybody else. So he couldn't go in less than because of what you're born into. And then think about this. To me, this is super ironic. He's put next to the gate. What's the gate called? The what gate? The beautiful gate. There's nothing beautiful about this dude's life. Absolutely nothing beautiful about his life. He's sitting there. He can watch people go in and out of the temple, but he can't go. He can watch people go in and celebrate, he can watch people go in and be set free and forgiven from their sins. He can, he can go in and he can hear people getting hands laid on them and maybe being healed of what their ailment was, but he could not go. Nothing could happen for him. So why was he put there? So he could beg from the people going into the temple. This is not the life he wanted. This is not the life he wanted for himself. And because of that, because of where people put him, because of how people treated him, he felt less than. Now, if you're here and um, you've been around any amount of time here at Central, odds are you know at least part of my story. Over the years in my spiritual walk with Jesus, I have felt less than in so many rooms, in so many environments. And and it's not just me, some some of you too. Because here's what I know about Carroll, Iowa. This is what I know from living here for 12 plus years. This is what I know from having two kids that went through the school system. In Carroll, Iowa, what you did in middle school and high school will follow you through your senior adult years, yes or no? It's not just me. A lot of you struggle with it too. People identify you with what you did. People call you who you used to be. That's why some people here feel less than. But you didn't even do it. Like you didn't see something coming. You didn't choose it. It just came after you. You didn't see the divorce coming. You didn't plan on the addiction. You didn't plan on the abortion, but it happened. And if you could go back and do it again, pause, you can't go back and do it again. But because of that thing you did, or because of what was done to you, you feel less than. And when you feel less than, you will spend the rest of your days begging people, begging God, for scraps from the king's table when as his children, we've actually been given a seat at the table and we don't have to ask for scraps anymore. I don't know what you're used to. I just know in this room, in this church, no more less than people, amen? Which leads to number three. No more low expectations. No more low expectations. When it comes to church, 
I do not believe we should have low expectations. Going back to growing up as a church kid, I didn't have a lot of expectations. As a matter of fact, I had zero expectations, except, except to see one of the nuns wreck in the parking lot again. I thought that'd be great. But I don't want us as a church, as people in the church, to have low expectations. Not because of what God might do in the building, but what God wants to do in each and every one of our lives. I tell you all the time around here, each and every one of you created on purpose, with a purpose, and for a purpose. Intricately designed by the creator of the universe. Unique, with a special purpose, and a special plan. And so let me ask you this question. What is it that God wants to do inside of you that hasn't happened yet? What is it? What is it that God has promised you? What is it that God has spoke to you? What step are you waiting to take that God has said, hey, you need to take this step. If you take this step, this, th this, and like, like, what is it? What is it God wants to do inside of you that hasn't happened? See, a lot of times we just give up because going back to the last point, we feel less than. I want you to hear me. Do not think so low of yourself that you don't think that God has some supernatural plan that will absolutely blow your mind. Because if he's about to do what he's about to do to this guy in this story, what can he do for each and every one of us? So watch what happened. I love this. Verse 3. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Now, just a quick question. It's in the text, so I have to address this here. Does it ever bother you, maybe a little sometimes, when you're trying to go somewhere, trying to get in somewhere and somebody's asking you for money? Because it does me. Am I the only sinful thoughtful person here you got any money nope no not not a dime man i don't carry any cash um he's asking them for money last week um i was really 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 thinking about this and what that really meant and and this kind of led me to that opening question of what would you ask for this guy's been lame for 40 years hasn't been able to walk if he could ask for anything in the world if he could ask for anything what do you think he would ask for to be able to do what walk right that's what he really wanted that's what he really wanted but because he had been that way for 40 years he allowed his handicap his his dysfunction to become his identity instead of asking for what he really wanted because again we can all agree dude wanted to walk but he settled for hey do you have a few coins do you have a little bit of money that can sustain me in my dysfunction see one of the problems that we get caught up in the, wor in, the, in the church world is, is that we'll get caught up in something. And that something could be anything. It could be any sinful habit. It could be any sinful pattern. It could be anything that kind of controls and dominates our lives. But when we get there, we begin to think, there's no way God will deliver me out of this. There's no way God can set me free from this. There's no way God can help me. There's no way God will bring me through this. Instead of, and so instead of asking for something miraculous to happen in my life, I'll just ask God to help me get through the day. And listen to me. I do not believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross so we could make it through the day. I think that he died on the cross so we could experience the supernatural. That he wants to do way more in our lives than we want for our lives. Because his plans are greater than our plans. His, his ways are higher than our ways. And, and he wants to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. But this guy, because he's been oppressed and because he's been pushed down and because labels have been put on him his entire life, he thinks the only thing he can do is ask for some money. And watch what happens. Verse 4, Peter and John looked at him intently. And Peter said, look at us, which is strange to me because I see them as like staring at him and he's looking away because it's strange somebody staring at you. Verse 5, the lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some what? Some what? Some money. See, his expectations were so low because somebody told him, you're born that way. You're always going to be that way. You're stuck in that condition. Nothing good can ever happen to you. Nothing good's ever going to happen for you. No one's ever going to be able to help you. And he had accepted what people said about him. And because he accepted what other people had said about him, he's refusing to believe that God actually had a greater plan for him. And I understand that. I do. I, I, if you've been that way, think about this. If you've been that way for 40 years, don't you feel forgotten by God? Don't you begin to think you're all by yourself? But watch what happens, verse six. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. Now, I like to think that as soon as Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, man, the guy's probably saying, then what good are you? Get away from me. Just keep moving on, going to the temple. There's some people coming behind you. I know they got some coins, just because just, that's what I'm thinking. 
But then he said, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. I imagine John going, what? Oh, Pete, Petey, come here, buddy. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Do you see this guy? Do, do, do you see what he's doing? See how he's dressed? See him just laying there? Peter, he can't walk. I've walked for 40 years. You're asking him to walk? Don't you think that's a little bit much? I mean, we could all agree that the man had low expectations, but can we also agree that maybe, possibly, Peter's expectations were a little high? I mean, what's the difference? I mean, the guy had low expectations. Peter's like, hey, get up and walk. Guy's like, I just want a few coins. And Peter's like, no, walk. Well, here's the difference. Peter had actually been with Jesus. He'd walked with Jesus. And because Peter had been with and walked with Jesus, Peter knew what Jesus was capable of doing in this man's life. And so Peter, instead of saying, oh, yeah, you know what, man, I'm going to enable your dysfunction. Here's a few coins. Um, I'm just going to enable you to stay that way. Peter said, "Uh -uh. uh-uh, uh-uh, ain't no way. I want you to get up and walk. How's that translate to us today? Jesus wants to deliver you out of your condition. Jesus wants to pull you out of your dysfunction. Jesus wants to set you free from what's held you in bondage for years. See, I believe there are people in our church, you've struggled with things your entire life, like depression, your whole life. You know what? God can set you free from depression. God can set you free from anxiety. God can set you free from addiction. Because we can walk into this place knowing that there's going to be a a holy shift where we no longer settle for low expectations from the king, the king. The king of kings who could do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine. Amen? Which leads to number four. Number four is this. No more pretending you can do this on your own. No more. No more pretending you can do this on your own. One of the biggest problems in the church world is there are so many people. You think you can do this walk with Jesus by yourself. And listen to me, we say this all the time around here, you can't do life alone. None of us can do life alone. We need the help of Jesus and the help of others to make it through life. One of the reasons that people struggle and even die spiritually is because they're too afraid to raise their hand and say, hey, I need some help. Trust me, I've taken that trip. I ain't never going there again, ever. So watch what happens next, verse seven. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand. Now, if you're standing here watching this, you got your phone out, you're videoing this, you're thinking this is the cruelest thing in the world. He takes the lame man by the right hand. What's he going to do? Is he going to pull him up and let him go, and he's going to fall back down? Before we get there, let me, let me kind of say this, and don't miss this. This is huge. Beggars in that time period would have held a cup. And they would have held a cup so you could put coins in the cup. That's all he wanted, some coins in the cup. Chances are the people who carried him there and put him out there gave him the cup, They got a percentage of what he collected, and so they probably put a few coins in there so he could jingle around so people, when they came by, thought, well, other people have given and guilted them into giving as well. Like, that's what he wanted. That's what he expected were some coins. But in order to take Peter's hand, he would have had to put the cup down in order to grab hold of Peter. And I want you to hear me. There's some people here today that you're going to have to put down your cup of pride and actually accept somebody's offer to help you. Because again, at the end of the day, we need each other if we're gonna make it through this thing called life. Now, from time to time, I kind of alluded to this earlier, I'll hear hear people say, well, you know, all I need is Jesus, that's it. All I need is Jesus and coffee. If it's just me and Jesus, I'm good. No, you're not. No way. No way. Because listen, if all you need is Jesus, If Jesus is just enough, then why didn't Jesus just need Jesus? Why wasn't Jesus just enough for Jesus? This is going to mess with your theology right now. Because see, in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he prays. This is the night that he's betrayed. This is the night where he's going to be crucified the next day. You remember he goes out there and he's praying so hard that he starts like sweating drops of blood. Well, before that happened, he walked up to his three closest friends, Peter, James, and John. He walked up in and he said in verse 38, hey, please go with me, guys. Please go with me. My soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. I want you to hear me, and don't miss this. If Jesus needed other people, then all of us need other people as well. I want Central to be a place where it's okay, where we can put the cup of pride aside, extend our hand, and ask for help, and where we 
can also extend our hand and help other people. Peter reaches out and grabs him by the right hand and helps him up. And, and, and I want you to hear this. That's the difference between religion and relationship. Religion pushes you down, Jesus helps you up. Religion pushes you down, a relationship with Jesus, Jesus helps you up. That's the difference. That, that, that's why we're about a relationship with Jesus here in this place, because we're not trying to push anybody down, we're trying to help somebody up. Because listen, don't, don't miss this. And me, for, this is for me. If it wasn't for the hand of Jesus and other people in my life, I'd be flat on my face. I'd be in a gutter, I'd be in a ditch, I'd be in a hospital, I'd be in jail, I'd be dead. But Jesus and other people extended their hand and helped me up. And this church is always going to do the same. As he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. And what he did here in this text, I believe he wants to do in this place. Now listen, I get it. Some of you are tuning out right now. I'm talking about asking for help. You're like, I'm never asking for help. I get it. It's scary to ask for help in the church. Because once you ask for help in the church, like, like your prayer request turns into the gossip line. I, I get it. I understand that. But in this church, we all understand that we're messed up. We're all messed up. Broken, messy people. You know how I know that we're all broken and messy? Because broken and messy is all there is. That's it. We're all broken, messy people. We all need this. Again, I'm telling you, and this is the honest to God truth, if there were not people in my life who are willing to extend their hand and help me up, I would not be here today. This is what I know personally. If you don't put pride aside, one day you'll hit a wall going 100 miles an hour, and nothing good comes out of a collision like that, nothing. I really want this to be a place where it's okay to not be okay, but it really is not okay to stay that way. This is a place where you can confess, I messed up. It's not gonna surprise anybody in this room, it's not. I want this to be a place where you can ask for help. That's why we have a prayer team every Sunday. It's the end of every service, every time I get done preaching, people ask me, why do you do that invitation? Why do you say that every week? It's because if you need somebody to pray with you or for you, we have a group of people in the back of the sanctuary who would love to pray with you and for you. Like, that's why they come to church, to minister to you in that way, because we all understand we can't do life alone. Listen, nothing, nothing, nothing in the church world shocks me anymore, except for Christians who try to pretend they can do it on their own. This is a place where you don't have to fight alone. This is a place where you don't have to run. You don't have to fight or run anymore on your own. You can have an army of people around you. So these are the last point. No more staying silent. No more staying silent. If you're a um, sports fan of any kind, doesn't matter your team. I'm not making fun of your teams today. Calm down, Iowa fans. I'm not. Um, but let's say, let's say your team is down by a few points and they're, they're driving. Let, let's, let's March Madness. Let's talk about basketball. Let's say they're down. There's a few seconds left on the clock. They're down two points. And somebody, somebody hits a three. And, and there's like .9 seconds left on that clock. They go ahead. They're going to win the game. There's no way the other team is, could possibly come back and win. When you're watching and they hit that basket, as that ball swooshes through that net and they go ahead as a true fan, what do you do every time? You lose your dang mind, right? Hands in the air, celebrate like there's no tomorrow. Woo! We gonna win, baby! Yeah! Right? That's what the church should be like every week. No more staying silent. We should celebrate. Like, like we should celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ has done something in our life or in the life of somebody around us. Like, we should understand the grace of God. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, we wouldn't be here. It, if it wasn't for how good that he has been, that none of us would be in the place that we are right now. Because listen, the scripture says this, verse 8. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. Do you think he was celebrating, yes or no? Do you think when he walked in, the people who saw him, who knew the condition he'd been in for 40 years, the people who had put some coins in his cup, were celebrating, yes or no? Yeah. Do you think they went to Pizza Ranch after the service and said, I don't know, dude probably been faking it for 40 years. No! They were celebrating. That's what church should be. 
Church should be a place of celebration, never a place of condemnation, because we have a God who can do things that are far greater than we could ever possibly imagine, and we need to celebrate that week in and week out. Celebrate Jesus, who he is, and what he's done in our life, because there's no one or nothing greater than him. Amen? Next week is Easter. I'm telling you, it is not going to be ordinary here. We're going to celebrate the resurrection. First off, there's nothing ordinary about that. But we're going to speak to people who feel less than. And you should have high expectations about what Jesus is going to do to change lives next week in our Easter services. Get as many people here as possible. L- listen, not for me, not for you, not so we can meet some church quota, but for them. Because listen to me, if you know of a place where the presence of Jesus is real, and you truly believe the power of Jesus changes lives, why wouldn't you want them here? Why wouldn't you want to help them meet Jesus? Do you really want to keep it all to yourself? Do you really want it just to be you and Jesus? Do you really want to have the mentality of all I need is Jesus? I don't want to share him with anybody else. Mm -mm. See, we're going to celebrate Jesus in a unique way, crazy way. You don't want to miss it. Again, come early and stay late. Because we're not going to just celebrate what God is doing in this building and never understand what God wants to do in each one of our lives and in the lives of people around us. And I want us to be open to receive what he wants out of each and every single one of us. And that means no more ordinary Sundays. That means no more less than people. That means no more low expectations. That means no more staying silent. Let's pray. God, right now, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you that you take things that are broken and abandoned and lame and hurt and confused and worried and filled with doubt, and you make changes in our lives. God, that you use messy and broken people, because messy and broken people are all that there are. God, I pray that we would be a people who would desire to be close to you understanding what it is that you can do in us, what it, what it is that you want to do in us and through us. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I asked you this question, and, and I want you to just take a minute and kind of work through it. What is that work that Jesus wants to do in you? What is that miracle that you stopped asking him for? What is that holy shift that needs to take place in your life? Who needs to ask for help today because you know you can't make it on your own? Who, who's tired of asking for normal when he's able to do the supernatural. If Jesus spoke to your heart during this message, take a minute and speak back to him right now. And just tell him, yes, Lord. Yes, I surrender. Yes, you can have that part of my life. Yes, I will go there. Yes, I will follow. Yes, I will start doing what you tell me to start doing. I will stop doing what you tell me to stop doing. Yes, I give you everything. Maybe you're here today and you've never prayed to receive Jesus Christ in your life and you know that's the decision you need to make for Jesus to come into your life. If that's you, I just want you to pray this prayer in your heart right where you sit. We, we get this prayer. We, we say this every week and we get it from Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 says, if you, believe in your, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not you might be, not you could be, not possibly Not if you follow a list of rules, if you do this, 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 and this. No, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. And so right now, if that's you, you can just pray this. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, and I need your forgiveness. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross, and I believe you rose from the grave, and I know you did that to pay for my sin. And so right now, Jesus, I receive you into my life. Come in, take over. You can have it all. All of me for all of you. Today, I ask you to be my Lord, to be my God, to be my King, to be my Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for saving me. Heads bowed and eyes still closed. If you just prayed that prayer for the first time, like if that's the first time you prayed it in your heart and you meant business, we would love to know. Mike's gonna close us out in a song and as he does, there'll be people in the back corners of our our sanctuary, our prayer team, 
who would love to pray with you for you, celebrate with you, talk to you about next steps. Use this as an opportunity to do that. Maybe you're here, maybe you're struggling with something. Maybe something really spoke to your heart, you don't know how to sort it out. Listen to me, do not do life alone. There are people here to walk with you. Use them. Allow them to minister to you. Allow the Holy Spirit to work through them into you. God, we love you and we praise you. And God, I just pray as we stand, as we sing this song, we, as we stand in your presence, the presence of our King, the King of King, the Lord of Lords, that you would move in the hearts of your people through the power of your Holy Spirit in ways only you can. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.